Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and it is my great pleasure to welcome Wendy Brown in today's episode. She is currently a professor at the School of Social Science at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Her achievements are so numerous that it would take up the whole podcast to list them all which is why I would instead like to express my absolute joy about having the possibility of talking to Wendy about a specific strand within future histories, namely the question of an alternative governmentality. The title of the episode already gives it away. I investigated this topic quite a bit over the course of future histories, mainly within the German language episodes, and I want to point you all towards some of those episodes Episodes, namely episode 36 of season 2 with Thomas Lemke zum Regieren der Dinge or episode 11 of season 1 with Frieda Vogelmann zu alternativen Regierungskünsten or to throw in a third one Episode 3 of Season 2 with Ute Tellmann zu Ökonomie als Kultur. There are many more and I list some of them in the show notes as well. And now before we start, I would like to welcome Katharina, Renko, Robin and Monika as patrons of Future Histories. And I would like to ask all of you that if you like Future Histories, please consider telling a possibly interested friend about it as well, since spreading the word helps a lot. Thank you so much for that. And now please enjoy today's episode with Wendy Brown on Socialist Governmentality. Welcome, Wendy. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on Future Histories. Thank you for having me. There is a strand within Future Histories that is concerned with the question of alternative governmentality. And I couldn't think of a better person to be included in this strand than you, Wendy. So there are two quotes by Michel Foucault I'd like to ask you about. Let's tackle them separately one by one. The first one goes... What governmentality is possible as a strictly, intrinsically and autonomously socialist governmentality? In any case, we know only that if there is a really socialist governmentality, then it is not hidden within socialism and its texts. It cannot be deduced from them. It must be invented. End quote. So, first of all, Would you agree with this assessment? And if yes, or maybe partly yes, how can we go about inventing such an alternative governmentality? Yes, I do agree with Foucault's statement and the notion that a socialist governmentality cannot be found in socialist texts. When Foucault made that statement, He didn't elaborate it, and I'd like to elaborate it a little bit to suggest what I think, maybe Foucault wouldn't share this, but what I think are the reasons. It's a commonplace that Marxism underemphasized the domain of politics as a domain of emancipation. The reasons for this are many. Marx's own critique of idealism and tacitly liberalism, which he identified with the state and identified with Hegelianism, led him to a form of historical materialism, complex, interesting, exciting, important, but a form that spied emancipation in what we would today call the social or the political economic, the domain of civil society, as he spoke about it in the early works, or the domain of political economy, as he would speak of it in Capital. All that is important, but what it neglects is the question of emancipation, and in my view, more specifically, democratization in the political domain. One of the things we know about the history of socialist revolutions and state communism is that they don't have a fine record of being politically emancipating, politically free, or democratically organized. There have been efforts. They usually don't last long. There are various reasons that different efforts were either subverted or 
failed early, but I want to pin the problem above all on the exclusion of the domain of the political from Marxist revolutionary concerns. Now, there's much more to say about that, um, but to get to the heart of your question, how could we have a socialist governmentality? I want to take that preface and simply bring it to the problem of what it would mean to be searching in Marxist texts for that governmentality. It's simply not there. What you can find certainly in Leninism and Stalinism and Maoism are various rules of the road for implementing a communist order, but that's really different. Implementation is really different than governmentality. What Foucault meant by governmentality itself, of course, is complex and contestable. Um, some people understand Foucault as, as combining government and rationality. Others understand him as talking about techniques and technologies of governing. But what I take him to be getting at is the principles, the order of reason by which governing takes place and saturates all of society. So it's a governing that does not simply happen at the level of the state or institutions, but a governing that organizes us. And of course, we all have become familiar by now with the idea of neoliberal governmentality, whether derived from Foucault or built from other thinkers since. Um, we know the idea that is best still encapsulated in Thatcher's encomium, that the aim of her Hayekian revolution was not simply to change the economic order, but to change the very soul of human beings. So governmentality pertains to the way we orient ourselves, the way we are oriented by an order of reason, or in Foucault's pithy formulation, a conduct of conduct, the way that an order of governing conducts our conduct. So what might an emancipatory socialist governmentality look like? That's your question. <laughs> um, or I think that's what's behind your question. And I'm going to disappoint because I don't think it's answerable in the abstract. I think this is one of those problems that has to be solved at what we used to call the level of praxis. That is, what emerges in a specific historical context and with the specific aspirations of a what I'm calling an emancipatory or de radically democratized governmentality rather than simply a governmentality that entails state planning and state discipline. And it will look different in different places. I don't think there's a prescription here. My own work of late has been in the domain that I'm calling provisionally reparative democracy. So it's socialist to be sure, but it's also a way of rethinking what we even mean or, or intend by democracy to think about both ecology, the damage that we inherit and that we now have to incorporate into democratic thinking, which means incorporating the non-human into the human as democracy, but also repairing the human damages at the site of capitalism, colonialism, racism, patriarchy, that persist into the future unless democratic practices are oriented by a reparative ethos. So you get hints here of what I'm thinking about in a governmentality that varies both from the histories of state communism and state socialism and the histories of bourgeois or liberal or constitutional democracy. But as I said, I know that disappoints you because I did not give you a recipe for socialist governmentality. In that, I'm still a Marxist. I don't think our task is to create cookbooks for the future.
Right, right. And I'm absolutely not disappointed by that, I have to add. Um, now, I think you kind of more or less already answered the second quote I wanted to ask you about, but I will nonetheless read it out loud. And uh, the second quote I wanted to ask you about goes, what socialism lacks is not so much a theory of the state as a governmental reason. The definition of what a governmental rationality would be in socialism, that is to say, a reasonable and calculable measure of the extent, modes and objectives of governmental action, end quote. So I'm still kind of interested in your opinion about this quote as well, because I think it does not really hint towards a blueprint of any sort, but it very much hints towards this question that you, that you uh, already touched upon, this question of a governmental reason that informs the way in which we enact ourselves within this alternative governmentality. And I think in order to engage with a different form of practice, We might go about it in two different ways. I mean, of course, we have to find out which type of uh, governmental reason uh, works and which doesn't, or a multiplicity of those. And we already have many, many, many different prefigurative examples through which we can learn about the ways in which this alternative uh, governmental reason, um, what this might look like. But nonetheless, I think when it comes to thinking about alternatives, it is still fruitful to ask ourselves what this gap within thinking about alternatives means for our practice. <laughs> I uh, Maybe to, to make this a bit more tangible for you, I'm, I'm very much engaging with uh, models or thinking about democratic economic planning. And I do very much understand that we will not have to look out for blueprints, but it does help to have an idea of how a democratic planned economy might work when it comes to convincing other peoples of an alternative. You already mentioned Margaret Thatcher. She's very much famous for stating that there is no alternative and we will have to convince people that there is indeed an alternative. And in order to convince people, I personally think it might help to have an answer on this level of abstraction as well when it comes to this question of alternative governmental rationality. So would you agree with uh, Foucault's uh, statement when it comes to this specific gap? Let me take your question apart a little bit and start with uh, your opening of the, of, of the problem. Foucault is, is such an interesting thinker in part because he spies absences and Uh, delusions in politics, but he himself is not a particularly able political thinker in in a in a beyond his genealogies and criticisms. And I, I don't mind that. That's not a criticism of him. We all have something we miss or things we're better at. Another and sharper way of putting this is that I don't think Foucault actually had much interest in democracy, in uh, political life, in political institutions. Uh, he was interested in other things, and he taught us a great deal in those other things and brought those other things into our political thought. I say this because I, I think he, again, gives us the bare outlines of a problem that we then not just have to fill in, but ask whether it's been posed correctly. So where I agree with him, is that we don't need more theories of the state. I'm old enough to have been raised on Marxist and socialist theories of the state. That's what we did for fun uh, intellectually uh, when I was coming through school in the 70s and the 80s. You know, the O'Connor, Habermas, Miliban, Poulancis, Ofe world of theories of the state was, was, was our morning breakfast. Um, but it didn't carry us very far because... Um, that's that's that that was neither what we needed for understanding how to make political change, 
political change was not going to be made at the level of seizing or overthrowing the state in the West. Uh, it was going to happen in another way. And it was also not very helpful for thinking about what we've talked about already, the problem of governmentality and governmental reason. So that's the frame. Yes, to, to, to setting aside theories of the state, but mm, hesitate with what Foucault has set out as the problem of governmental reason. I don't think we can develop textually, intellectually, a, a theory of socialist reason, governing reason. I've already said that, but I almost think that's what Foucault was beckoning toward. And it's strange for a guy who thinks so locally and genealogically to be inviting that. That said, I completely agree with you, Jan, that we have for, I think, probably the last 40 years, maybe longer, run scared of thinking about the problem of democratic economic planning. So if we just hive off that problem, not so much as a problem of governmental rationality or governmentality to core, but rather a specific problematic that we need to think about. It seems to me the elements of that problematic are these. We must have planning. Well, I, let me just add this other point. The obvious reason why we've run away from it, why the left has run away from it, is that neoliberalism chased us out and we let it. You know, it, it, it got such a bad name. It got a bad name from neoliberalism. It got a bad name from the right. And it didn't have a great name from the experiments with central planning. I, I think there are some important exceptions to that. We have to remember that China went from starvation to non-starvation. We have to remember that Cuba did a remarkable amount, given how bombarded it was by uh, what was up north and the rest of the West. Uh, we have to remember that there were places in Africa in the 70s, Tanzania and others, that um, really quite radically transformed the condition of peoples, not non non-humans, but peoples, um, for the better. So there were exceptions, but for the most part, central planning got also a bad name, not only from the right and the neoliberals, but from its own history in experiments with it. That said, there is no way to think about a sustainable, in every sense, well-organized, just order of things without some central planning. And we cannot any longer think about central planning without thinking about how to democratize it. So those are the two wings of the problem that I think you're bringing us. And I wanna suggest that the democratization has to happen from above and below. And what I mean by that is that a democratic way of thinking about orchestrating and implementing cent central planning has to be in the institutions themselves. We can't say, oh, bring in the technocrats and then somebody else will democratize. That doesn't work. The technocrats always win. Democracy is always secondary. It's a lot like saying, you know, bring in capital and then we'll think about the planet. It doesn't work. So when I say democratization has to happen from above, we have to be thinking from the get-go as we rethink central planning and economic planning, how to organize it, not just in a thin democratic way, that is to be fair at the distributive level and inclusive, but also how to incorporate voices, all kinds of voices, especially minor voices, into the project of planning itself. And this is where the technocrats get very unhappy. They understand themselves as experts. They understand themselves as knowing what to do efficiently, well, and expertly. 
Uh, and the idea of these other voices is noise to them, but it's not noise. It's the only way that we'll get democracy into the top and make planning a democratic exercise. What do I mean from below? Central planning always fails to the degree that it homogenizes human and ecological toposcapes. It always fails to the extent that it imagines that we can all be treated the same, that one principle or one form of distribution or one crop or one set of needs governs us all. Therefore, localities who have particular conditions at the level of the human, at the level of human histories, for example, something like the history of chattel slavery, or the history of indigenous dispossession, or the history of several people struggling over a particular land. So those histories have to be part of how one thinks about planning, or let's just say how one thinks about political economy, but also particular needs. Different zones of the planet and different domains, even within a single region, will have different understandings of what is fundamental to human life. And therefore, there has to be, in any economic planning governmentality, the capacity for knowledge and claims and democratic demands to emerge from below and affect the planning. Now, there are many ways to do this. Here, I'm not particularly interested in spelling them all out, but I will just say, you know, one way is to literally send the information up to the planners and hope for the best. But another way is to limit what planning does to certain forms of distribution and produ production and distribution and allow localities to do as they need to do with the effects, with what planning, as it were, delivers, rather than specifying and organizing and ordering everything from the top. So those are the two elements that I think have always been missing. But of course, as you say, they are elements that are being homegrown in a, in a million local experiments around the planet. I mean, all kinds of peoples are experimenting with everything from agricultural cooperatives to ways that towns and townships, villages and cities can take on for themselves the question of what they need at the level of infrastructure, at the level of, of things like, like the handling of, of refuse and, and recycling at the level of um, the question of water allocation and developing potable water possibilities. These things can't come from the top. They have to come from the people who know what they are actually living, but also at the level of people who know what the various histories and demographic components are that would make justice at the local level. I fully agree, I have to say, and I would only add that if we have a form of planning that is coming from above and below, it's not longer, um, strictly speaking, central planning, because we will have decentral and uh, central uh, elements alike, and that's basically more or less the, the state of the planning debate at least in some parts <laughs> within the debate that we need both and that there will have to be a semi-autonomy for the decentral parts, not full autonomy, because there will, as you rightly stated as well, have to be a central element as well. But still, I would like to dig a little bit deeper there because then the question pops up how to mediate between these different levels, how to mediate between interests on the decentral uh, side of things mm -hmm. and interests on the central side of things because these might be in conflict at times. And the question arises how to mediate between these different interests. And I want to maybe open up this question 
by picking up on the beginning of your answer where you stated that maybe Foucault kind of raised the bar too high by uh, asking for a socialist reason. And I would maybe like to shift this a little bit and point towards the question or maybe the problem when it comes to a question of alternative governmentality. I would like to point towards this aspect that we can find within neoliberalism and that is markets as a site of veridiction and a production of truth because within neoliberalism these questions of mediation the question i mean markets fulfill different functions of course mm -hmm. but one of them would be the production of truth and uh, being a site of veridiction and thereby also kind of mechanism for the resolution of these conflicts. Of course, not to the benefit of everybody, but uh, it is a mechanism that kind of addresses this question of mediation, more or less through market forces, kind of. Mm -hmm. I would be interested in your opinion on what might an alternative to markets as sites of veridiction and production of truth look like because uh, it's a very potent technology of power so to speak right now and if we do not want to delegate many of our problems or conflicts to this realm of markets then we would have to ask ourselves on this level of abstraction what an alternative to markets as sites of veridiction might look like and i think this is um, a very difficult question at least for me because within the planning debate the answer mostly is okay we will do it democratically but i think it's not really addressing the full depth of the problem to just state that we will do it democratically because of course then the question pops up okay but what is the frame of reference for these democratic uh, decisions what is the subject of democracy democracy as you rightly pointed out as well so there's a host of other questions <laughs> attached to simply stating we will do it democratically so i would be very very much interested in your opinion on uh, finding alternatives to markets as sites of veridiction the idea that markets are simply a site of veridiction is a little bit of a cloak for what actually happens now And we know that if we think about it. Markets are not actually free and they're not actually deciding things for us freely. The most obvious example of this is the work that we get from Benjamin Braun, Daniela Gabor, on what finance, especially private finance, asset managers, private equity, how it's mobilized politically to set the terms for itself through states. So the idea that markets are simply a site of veridiction because they organize for us and they deliver a truth that the market has delivered, that's a little bit of BS. And I think Foucault may or may not have known that. I think he he knew that was the principle at the heart of neoliberalism. It's not one of the principles he subjected to critical interrogation. That is to say, he gave us the way that neoliberalism thinks or was being thought by intellectuals and the way that in turn it was implemented as a form of reason in regimes, I think if we ask ourselves, okay, what have you got that's better? What do you lefties have that's better than the market for deciding things? We'll still imagine that it's just a market deciding things, that it is not actually the mobilization of big capital, both big industrial capital, but now of course, big finance capital to act politically to decide things. So how might we do it differently? How might we act politically to decide things and set aside this issue of veridiction, of production of truth, 
as always, and I rarely use this word, but I'm going to use it now, as always ideological. That is, that, that, that idea that the market tells the truth, at least about itself, is not true. It's ideological. So our problem then is brought a little closer to the ground. What do we on the left propose? As an alternative to that way of deciding. Production, distribution, investment, and tolerable effects. I want to start with the last phrase. We on the left have to think about what are and are not tolerable effects. That is a democratic debate to some degree. But by tolerable effects, I mean ecological effects and human effects. And we can put them together and put humans in ecology and just say the entire ecology of the planet, what are tolerable effects? Is the the, um, destruction of the Amazon, is the uh, fouling of all of our waters with with, uh, nanoplastics a tolerable effect? You and I would quickly say no is the deracination of human beings by climate change and by the movability of industry uh, that that torpedoes entire uh, regions and even sometimes countries when an industry gets up and moves or when climate change makes life uninhabitable. Is that a tolerable effect? No. So then, then our principle of democratic economic planning, and I appreciate you taking the central out of it. I'm not part of these planning debates, so you're 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 playing with somebody here who's who's an amateur, and I, I assume you know that. <laughs> um, our principle has to be what are the effects we want to generate instead? And then within that domain, we can have democratic debate about how best to generate them. We want human justice. We want ecological sustainability. We want to limit the damages that have already that are already in motion, like climate change, that can't be radically stopped. We know that now, but can be slowed and attenuated. We know those are the effects we want to address. So then, then we then we have we do have arguments about how best to do it. But that is very different than saying, let the market decide. Even different from saying, okay, we want decarbonization, let the market decide. Because the market is it deciding. Big capital is deciding, and it's deciding just how much decarbonization is profitable and just how much is not. And that will not get us to dealing with those effects. Maybe uh, just for the audience and for the record, <laughs> I absolutely do not uh, buy into the what you uh, correctly called bullshit <laughs> of markets as sites of a very addiction in the sense of that I myself do believe that it does in fact function in this type of fashion. Also, maybe as an add-on, uh, people who try to actually implement it in this specific function. For example, in the crypto realm, there are people who try to create prediction markets and stuff like that. It always fails, <laughs> but it is, it's, the, it's, it's an attempt to really create markets as sites of very addiction for real, and it always fails. But nonetheless, it is very much successful as a, let's say, economic tale. Uh, yes. It is very much successful in influencing the yes. political realm yes. as an economic tale. And as such, it is very powerful. So I think we would have to find an uh, alternative, maybe economic tale as well, that works for our uh, part as well. And maybe I would like to kind of just as an add on to the, the question that I asked before, uh, I want to ask if you think that the fact that this idea of markets as sites of veridiction and that these sites of veridiction escape human judgment and that this is uh, 
like part of the game for neoliberals, you know, that this creates a um, a different aspect for the task of creating alternative economic tales. I would like to quote you maybe because you state that neoliberalism is secured by virtue of a government rationality in which the very diction of the market, its truth principle, establishes it as both ontologically incontestable and ubiquitu ubiquitously, oh shit, that's the German, ubiquitously applicable, even as its actual dynamics are unknowable, end quote. So this, of course, creates a, a certain aspect of, let's say, maybe quasi-metaphysical escape room where where you can always point towards this unknowability as a neoliberal you can always point towards this uh, unknowability of the market and kind of create a type of self immunization uh, by by pointing to this metaphysical space you know and if we do not want to engage in such a behavior where we kind of create a unknowable space where we can point towards then we would have to engage with the how, how do I phrase that we would have to think about how to address this specific function within our alternative economic tale because it of course it fulfills a function yes. it's easy to say no as a politician yes. today to the populace by pointing towards the market but if we have a democratic economic plant uh, political economy, we would still have to say no. <laughs> I think the task for the economic tale, so to speak, or for the for the political aspect of this economic tale would have to address this, this aspect that is right now being handled through this metaphysical layer within neoliberalism. Who believes this tale and who doesn't? Housing is a good example today with so much private equity and housing. As we know, it's become out of reach both at the level of home ownership and the level of rentals for ordinary people. And that's a transformation from 40 years ago, a generation of working class people 40 years ago who could access with ease rental markets for housing and access with a little more stretch home ownership. It's just out of the question now. Do people believe that the market delivers a truth in that regard? No. I mean, what they're told is we have a we have a supply problem. That's the common political response. We need to build more housing. Um, but that's not a problem. Our problem is housing has become an asset. It's become an investable asset, an extraordinarily lucrative investable asset, bubbles notwithstanding. And people are making tons of money on housing at the level of a financialized good. Do, do ordinary people think the market is delivering a truth or do they have some sense that it's not so much that it's true as that it's, as you put it, it's inarguable, that truth hangs over it. So why start here with your question? Because I think the left always has a double task. You want me to give us a new set of principles by which to, to arrive at a truth or to have a governing truth, a, a left truth, but I think what always has to happen first is you have to take apart that veridiction, which, as you said, you don't agree with, I don't agree with, we know it's BS. But until we take it apart, the idea of deciding on housing as a human right, as a an entitlement for every human being, because humans don't shelter themselves the way other kinds of critters do in the wild, that, that move requires first the dismantling of, of the veridiction of the market. And I 
I, I, I know this isn't where you want to hang out and I appreciate that. It's like, okay, we know the critique. We know the critique. What do we got that is going to replace it? But what you're also asking is how do we persuade people to move away from that other, other order of their addiction? And I'm saying this is where critical theory remains essential. And I don't mean critical theory at a, at a, at an effete, highly erudite level. I mean it popularized. Now, I, I do think, staying on housing, for example, that once we do that, it makes the idea of public investment in housing, social housing, whatever you want to call it, um, viable again, and without constant reference to its failures in the past. I mean, you're in Vienna, so you have a kind of beautiful example of gorgeous social housing, but that's rare. Um, but that has to be the set of moves we make. This is why the veridiction of the market is actually nonsense. This is what's actually happening in the market. It's rigged, as we put it in the US. It's rigged from the bottom to the top. It's not ever free. <laughs> it's organized politically and through concentrations and, and through law that permits, for example, the tremendous flow of, of private finance into the zone of something like housing or healthcare or um, increasingly um, in, in my country, uh, education and all kinds of other basic goods that ought to be provided as collective public social goods. I know this is an unsatisfying answer, but what I'm suggesting is we constantly have to make that move from the deconstruction or criticism of the veridiction of the market to the, the idea that these goods that the market is so-called organizing and distributing actually ought to be goods that we think about and plan and finance as goods available to every human being on the planet. And since we're still in the domain of nation states, just start more locally, every human being within the purview of any particular state. I invoked housing as a right, but I rarely use that language. Um, I Entitlement always has another inflection in English um, that, that always sounds a bit wrong. So I, I would just say a basic necessity for human beings as opposed to a market good. I mean, you know, look, that's what neoliberalism did to us. It told us that everything we need and everything that the planet needs ought to be marketized. And that's, the, that's what has to be undone and put in a political and social language. Our, our veridiction has to be political and social, not economic. Right, and I would add, that it doesn't have to be, or that it maybe shouldn't be a truth as well, because you kind of framed it in a way that sounded as if I was looking for kind of a socialist truth <laughs> to be a bit polemic. Mm. But my intuition would be that we would have to find a way of developing widely accepted modes of veridiction or of um, maybe no, not consensualization. That's also not the right term. Mm. They have to be contestable and they have to be contingent. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right. I, I think that's where you're headed with this. I, I, I think that um, that's right. And yet, I think we want to put some limits on contestability. Like, to go back to the example I was offering, it's intolerable for for one in eight people in my city to be living on the streets. It's intolerable. That's a truth. I mean, you can call it what you will. It's inhumane, it's evil, it's monstrous, whatever your favorite word, it's a limit on the contestability of the truth that has to govern our order of things. Right, absolutely. I would fully agree with that, of course. I think um, why I'm trying to insist on it not being a truth, quote unquote, is that within the planning debate, when it comes to thinking about uh, alternatives to markets as sites of veridiction, you kind of 
easily fall into the trap of thinking that we would only have to kind of unveil the real truth of the economy or create a sense of full transparency, which would then yeah. uh, kind of yeah. self-evidently um, clear the, the open questions that we have, because now it is all intelligible and we can then go on to have a more or less, uh, let's be a bit polemic, uh, technocratic way of Uh, governing this reality that is then discovered as the underlying truth that has been unveiled. And that would be a mistake in my understanding. I completely agree with you. We need to wean from the idea of truth in politics, but those are risky sentences these days uh, for all the obvious reasons. The alternative to truth isn't lies, it isn't deceit, it isn't authoritarian mobilization of the masses based on myths and rancor and wild claims. The alternative to truth is, as you say, a recognition that deliberation and contestation are never ending. And, and to go back to your earlier question about mediation, how do you mediate between different interests from top to bottom in thinking about economic planning, democratic economic planning. We can come up with mechanisms for mediation, but there will be no end to those conflicts. That is the important burden that we import into socialism when we import democracy fully into it. Now there's no end to arguing, to contestation, to conflicts of interest. There's no end of history. There's no point where it's all beautiful and rational and clean and pleasant, and we can all go to sleep finally on the political question. It's it's ours forever. Yeah, that, for me personally, that's fine. <laughs> it's much better than the status quo. But let me uh, complicate it a bit more because at some point within our conversation you rightly stated that in order to be fully democratic it would have to entail some form of democratically incorporating the non-human mm -hmm. and this is uh, also a question that I asked many of my guests within future histories and I have to say that I mostly hit a wall, uh, not that people are not interested in in uh, answering the question, but it is, of course, a very difficult question to, to answer. So if we want to work towards, um, let's say, democratic planning in a strong sense, that is not only falling back into kind of old school notions of the uh, sovereign subject as the nucleus of this idea of democracy, mm -hmm. but tries to enlarge the populace or at least the way the that which is considered within the democratic processes. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe phrase it that way. How can we go about it in very practical terms? Because mm. of course, it's not that, I don't know, the river can kind of engage in democratic deliberation, of course not. And if we want to kind of, let's say, quote unquote, listen to the needs of the non-human, there will have to be some form of sensing, translation, mm -hmm. some form of process that is mm -hmm. able to include this uh, non-human sphere into the democratic process in a sensible manner. Do you have uh, any yeah, <laughs> approaches towards this very big and complicated question, I guess. It is a very complicated and challenging question, and I think it's our most important challenge today. I am working on this very problem. I don't think that the experiments with extending existing democratic principles to the non-human have been very successful for some fairly obvious reasons. And they're beautifully encapsulated in a recent article. I can't remember the title, but the author is Alain Potage. He does a beautiful job of, of summarizing the limits of extending 
rights to trees, animals, watersheds, oceans, rivers, etc. And um, I would add that constitutionalizing nature, which seemed promising at first, I think we've learned a very hard lesson in Ecuador as it so quickly gave up the constitutional protections it established for very lucrative oil drilling rights. The quick answer to why these methods are not adequate for bringing non-human life, the planetary, ecological life, people want to name it differently in their endless quarrels about naming that I'm not so interested in. The quick answer to why those things have failed is that they are staying within a humanism, rights, constitutions, etc., and and not reconstructing either the notion of politics or the subject of politics itself to do what is most essential. And that is to grasp and act on our deep imbrication with all planetary life. And, you know, whether you learn about this imbrication from Bruno Latour or whether you learn about it from other thinkers, it doesn't take very much reading these days to grasp that the deepest flaw of humanism, besides its centering on a particular kind of white European man, is the exclusion, the imagined autonomy from nature that is now facing us squarely as the imperiled planet and imperiled us, that climate change and extinction chains and biodiversity collapse and fouling of waters and lands all faces us with. So how to approach this? without using the tools of liberal humanism, constitutionalism, rights, etc. And again, I think my answer will be unsatisfying. It's provisional. As I say, I'm working on this right now. But I think it requires, again, both a transformed set of institutions where nature is not the add-on, is not the final step in the consultancy, but is always built in. So you don't have a separate department of environmental protection as we do here in in all of the departments of the federal administration. You know, we have one for that and then 15 for other things like transportation and labor and education and everything else. It has to be everywhere, everywhere. And secondly, it has to be built deep into democratic education. If democracy is about the people and the people need to know stuff in order to be Democrats, they don't just need to know their human history. We need to know what we are as ecological creatures. We need to understand that deep imbrication with all with all of planetary life, that means that when we enact certain projects on earth, we are killing that life and killing ourselves. We need to have that knowledge so deep in our formation, like a religious formation, but without the myth, (laughs) It has to be the kind of formation, if you do have a religious formation, in which you can't get it out of yourself. You, you, you can't expunge it. You can try to, you can try to stop believing, but, but it's in you. And that has to be fundamental in remaking democratic subjects. We have to be able to think of ourselves not as autonomous, as you say, not as autonomous sovereign subjects, but as codependent or interdependent creatures with all kinds of other life that sustains us and which we can sustain or damage. And once that reorientation happens, you think about everything differently. You think about you think about how to build an infrastructure differently. You think about labor differently. You think about um, 
po economic policy differently. You stop thinking, oh, we have to bring down inflation, full stop. You think, um, what are the conditions of production, distribution, and consumption that are killing the planet all the time? So it's a big answer. I'm trying to fill in the details. I, I do have some specific elements of what I think changes in democracy have to be. For example, I think there's too much emphasis on free speech and too much, too little emphasis on listening. You use the word yourself. Um, and by listening, I mean learning to be able to listen to the unvoiced, learning to be able to listen to all that is thriving or dying in the world differently than we do now, not just listening to one another and there's and 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 not just preoccupying ourselves with our right to speak. Um, so a democratic virtue in a reparative or ecological democracy would be the virtue of that capacity for listening, which of course, as you already mentioned, also involves developing the arts of translation. We 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 don't easily hear uh, the sound of a healthy or dying coral reef, but we can. It is possible to hear it. We can learn that. It's not that hard. And we have tremendous technologies to help us do it. Um, there's a beautiful book by a woman named Karen Baker, B-A-K-K-E-R, called The Sounds of Life. And she brings us all the ways in which digitalization and AI have made it possible for us to hear the planet differently, all of planetary life differently than we have in the history of humankind. That's important because humans are not very, we don't have very good ears um, <laughs> compared to other animals. Other animals use their listening for survival, for food, for cooperation, for, I mean, not just other animals, as we now know plants too. Um, there is a vibrational order in the universe that allows most of life to survive through what it registers in that vibrational order. We're not so good at that, but we can become better at it. And if we're going to use our technologies for anything in democratic life, it seems to me that's that's one of the things we could use them for as opposed to uh, social media sprees that create you know new fascist mobilizations. I think you probably get asked this uh, every other day or so, but what would you say is the state of neoliberalism today? Do you think we are witnessing a transformation towards some sort of post-neoliberal configuration or would this be too hasty to state? I think it's too hasty. I definitely think neoliberalism is more contestable now uh, around the world than it certainly was in its heyday. Uh, so I think its heyday is over. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's over. I also think it's important to see that neoliberalism has many iterations and that financialization really changed the game. Finance is still barely regulated and certainly uncontained. And I think it's the thing to keep your eye on if you want to ask, are we at the end of neoliberalism? <laughs> It's hardly caged. It's hardly contained. It rules more than it is ruled. It's not democratizable. It's not democratized. So I think it's too hasty to say neoliberalism is finished, but we clearly are in an era in which state projects are legitimate again. Even the right, even the right-wing neoliberals openly have state projects. So that discrediting of the state and of state projects and of social projects, that seems to be on the wane. However, I do not believe that means <laughs> that crucial elements of what many of us have identified as neoliberalism, the supervenience of the market, the supervenience of capital, the untouchability of certain aspects of the market and capital, 
those are still very much with us. And I guess that means my answer is we're in a shift. We're in some new iteration. And there are openings, really important openings, for the left to up the level of their contestation of neoliberalism, of its austerity measures, which are still rampant, as we know. I mean, look at the new left in Britain. It's carrying on the old austerity. Should we be so lucky as to avoid another Trump regime in the US? I don't have any doubt that austerity will continue to be part of the program of uh, Harris presidency. So we keep our eye on that. We keep our eye on finance. We keep our eye on the way in particular that decarbonization and other elements of a more sustainable ecological future are still in the hands of the market. And we don't quickly bury the thing and stop thinking along the lines of what form of neoliberalism do we have now? And then there's a question that I ask all of my guests at the end, and it is, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? I suppose a generation of young people that have been bequeathed a terrible world, a dark climate future, but who nonetheless have the courage to be political activists, to speak out, this generation, I, I, I bow down to. Wonderful. Wendy, thank you so much for your time and being part of Future Histories. Thank you. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.